So here's an interesting fact. If you took all of the cells found in your body and then sorted them and counted them based on which of those cells were your own, the ones that your body produced through mitosis, and which ones belong to microbes, the microbial ones would actually outnumber your cells by a factor of about three to one. In other words, there are three times as many microbial cells in your body than there are your own cells. The good news is the overwhelming majority of these cells belong to species that are part of your normal microbiota. Your normal microbiota consists of bacteria as well as some other eukaryotic species that live inside your body and actually, for the most part, are quite helpful. For example, they can aid in and help regulate your metabolism. They also function as part of your body's normal defense mechanisms. By living inside of your body, they help to fight off invading pathogens that could otherwise harm you. There are some drawbacks to having a normal microbiota, and what we're going to focus on today is discussing what our normal my microbiota works, looks like, how it operates, how it comes to be, and how it can help you as well as how it can harm you. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. You, as well as all human beings, have a normal microbiome. Your normal microbiome refers to the groups of microbes that live inside of you and on you throughout your lifetime, and actually have a profound influence on how your body operates. As we'll learn today, your normal microbiome is essential for how your metabolism operates. It's also an essential component of your immune system, helping to fend off potentially harmful pathogens that may try to invade your body throughout your lifetime. Now, where did your normal human microbiome come from? Well, it turns out that your microbiome was probably beginning to become in place before you were even born. At one point, we thought that the womb was sterile. So in other words, one, while inside the womb, you were not exposed to any microbes whatsoever. But there's new evidence that suggests that this may not be the case. So when a baby is born, the first stool that comes out of that baby is usually a sort of dark, thick, kind of tarry substance called meconium. And that meconium is the result of things that were ingested by the, by the fetus while it was still inside the womb. Now, you would suspect if the womb was completely sterile, that meconium would not include any bacteria or any other microbes. But it turns out that quite often meconium actually does contain bacteria, which suggests then that there are bacteria actually present inside of the womb to form a normal microbiota that exists inside there. This isn't necessarily shocking given that we know that the mother's placenta also has its own microbiome, its own collection of microbes that live there, and that's likely the source of the microbes that can be found inside the womb that are ingested by the fetus prior to being born. Now, regardless of whether the womb is sterile or not, colon your colonization of your microbiome begin during the birthing process. So as you're passing through the birth canal, coming into skin-to-skin -skin contact with your mother or other individuals, your skin is beginning to be colonized by environmental microbes and those found on the skin of other individuals. During breastfeeding, you would further acquire your normal microbiome as colonization of your gut begins in earnest through the skin bacteria that you're ingesting through your mouth from your mother's skin, as well as other bacteria that are present in the breast milk. Developing a normal microbiota is very, very important because there are many benefits to having a microbiota. In fact, without a microbiota, our bodies would not be able to exist the way it does because your normal microbiome is essential for numerous processes that have to occur in your body. So for example, your normal microbiome is responsible for how you process your food. A vast majority of your nutrition is due to the fact that there are microbes that exist inside of your gut that can help you digest your food, releasing essential nutrients, vitamins, minerals, things that you would not other be, otherwise be able to acquire from your food. It also functions as an important part of your, your body's defenses against foreign invaders. Remember, you are the home of those bacterial species and other species that live in your body. And just because they play nicely with you does not mean they play nicely with other microbes. If you remember from our conversation about, uh, about microbial interactions, one of those interactions was called antagonism. Well, it turns out that the majority of the species in your body don't want to give up their home. So they're willing to fight off other microbes in order to maintain their spot in your body. And oftentimes these microbes that are trying to take their homes are pathogenic. So the bacterial species on your skin help to fight off other bacteria that may want to get on your skin that could potentially harm you. And the same thing is true in your gut. That antagonism between those microbial species that live in your gut and other ones that are coming in and possibly invading you help to protect you and help keep you alive. In fact, this relationship between your body and your microbiome has evolved to the point where they actually are dependent upon each other. What that means is 
those those microbes inside of your gut actually help to train your immune system they actually influence what cytokines your immune cells release and has to keep them on guard even when there are no pathogenic microbes present but the big thing to remember about a microbiome is it is plastic and plastic refers to the concept that it can change it's not stable now, ideally, we'd have a stable microbiome that doesn't change over time, but it turns out that there are many different factors that can influence what species of microbes are able to persist in our body. And this, could cha this changes with the environment, so what you're exposed to. Obviously, you can't have microbes in you to which you've never been exposed. And exposure to other microbes may change what the microbial populations in your body look like. It can change with, along with hormonal changes. So as you grow and develop as a human being, your, what, can, what parts of your body are inhabited by microbes and what microbes are there actually does change along with them. It can change in response to nutrition. So a good deal of the microbes that colonize your gut, for example, make it in through the oral route. They come in through your mouth. They come in through what you eat and then survive off of the foods that you eat. So if you change your diet suddenly and go from, say, eating meat to no longer eating meat, that can influence profoundly what species of microbe are able to persist on your gut. Remember, they're living off of the food that you bring in. A final factor is medications. Most importantly, antibiotics. Remember, when we talked about broad spectrum antibiotics, one of the problems with those is they can have profound effects on your microbiome. They can target those species that live inside of your body that are healthy. So for example, if you're taking a broad spectrum antibiotic like tetracycline, there are hundreds or thousands of species in your body that could also be destroyed by that tetracycline, not just the pathogenic ones. And this can drastically change your body's microbiome. While there are many benefits to having a functional microbiome, and in fact, having one is essential, there are some potential problems associated with having thousands of species of microbes living in your body all the time. While most of the species that are part of your normal microbiome are either commensal or mutualistic with you, many of them have the potential to be opportunistic pathogens. So for example, if a species that is supposed to live in your intestines suddenly makes it into your urinary tract and finds itself in the wrong part of your body, now it can cause something like a urinary tract infection or another possible infection because it's in the wrong place. Alternatively, if there are massive shifts in your microbiome, so for example, if you're taking broad spectrum antibiotics, now all of a sudden certain species that aren't impacted by the antibiotic can grow and take over parts of the body they're not supposed to. So there are some potential consequences there. Another major issue is with thousands of species of micro living in our body, we're essentially incubators for antibiotic resistance. Remember how rapidly resistance factors can spread through horizontal gene transfer. Well, having thousands of different species of microbes packed into your intestines, for example, or hundreds of species on your skin, that increases the chance that microbes are going to share antibiotic resistance genes. And finally, one of the things we're learning about the microbiome is that if there is some sort of dysregulation of the microbiome, this can actually contribute to diseases. So for example, uh, problems with the microbiome have been associated with individuals that have irritable bowel syndrome. There's also some evidence that what your microbiome looks like can actually, uh, can actually factor into obesity and other metabolic disorders. There's also some issues that can occur if, if they become imbalanced. So for example, uh, yeast infections are typically the result of an imbalanced microbiota where uh, certain antagonistic species have been removed and the yeast candida albicans can actually overgrow. So all of these are potential problems associated with having thousands of species inside of your body. The good news is, is for the most part, the pros far outweigh the cons. So what does the normal human, human microbiome actually look like? Well, we're learning a lot about that right now through the activity of something called the Human Microbiome Project. Where using metagenomics, we are looking to identify the thousands of different species we find living inside of humans. Not surprisingly, we've identified thousands of species of bacteria as well as some species of archaea and fungi that are commonly found inside of human beings. But what we're also learning is that no human being's microbiome is identical to another's. In fact, your microbiome is probably as unique to you as your own fingerprints. So what we're also finding, or confirming, is what we previously thought was that there are parts of your body where microbes are not allowed to exist. So for example, there is no normal microbiome in places like your central nervous system. So there are no bacteria living inside of your brain normally, or inside of your heart muscles, or inside of, inside of internal organs such as your gallbladder or your liver. These are places that are refractory from having a normal microbiome. In other words, bacteria just aren't allowed to exist there. And that makes a ton of sense because one of the things we know about your microbiome is it's perfectly fine and normal and healthy to have bacteria in certain parts of your body, but when they leave their normal living environment, they can cause problems. As I mentioned before, if bacteria leaves your gut and makes it into your urinary tract, now that can cause a UTI, 
or if bacteria leaches out of your intestine and makes it into the rest of your body that can cause problems with other internal organs and can be potentially fatal. So your body has actually developed defense mechanisms to sort of trap microbes into the parts of the body where they belong. A large part of this has to do with the epithelial cells that make up the parts of the body that contain your microbiome. So the epithelial cells, for example, that line your gastrointestinal tract or your respiratory tract are joined together through things called tight junctions. So tight junctions acts as a watertight seal that actually prevents bacteria from being able to leave those tissues and make them into other tissues. This is an important part of having a microbiota is learning to contain your microbiota into the regions of the body where it's supposed to exist and failure to do so can cause problems. This is why trauma, whether it's a micro trauma or a macro trauma can be so problematic. So for example, if you have an infected appendix and it bursts, now we have a problem because the bacteria that were once living inside of your gut where they were normal and happy and healthy are now spilling into the rest of your body where they are not considered to be normal microbiota and can cause infections and potentially kill you mainly through sepsis. So now let's start by looking at some of the areas where we do find normal microbiota and talk about the species that we find there. So let's start by looking at the normal microbiota of our skin and eyes. So the skin's actually quite hostile to most microorganisms. It's frequently dry. Uh, sweat, for example, makes it incredibly salty. So things that don't like salt can't really live there. There's a low pH produced by your salt secretions. There's also uh, sebum that gets secreted on a regular basis. In other words, it's not a particularly hospital environment for things to live. However, there are many species of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus that thrive in this particular environment. We also find bacillus species as well as yeasts like Canada can also inhabit this particular portion of your body. If we look around the eyes, the internal portion of the eyes is devoid of microbiota. However, on the exterior portion, we do again find species of Staph and Strep. It's also common to find species of diphtheroids, which are, uh, which are Carini bacteria, um, which are gram-positive rods that commonly exist there. It's also not uncommon to find actually some enteric species, things like E. coli, Proteus, uh, and, and Klebsiella can often be found on the exterior portion of the eye. So moving inward, let's look at what we might find inside the mouth and the nose. Inside the mouth is very common to find non-pathogenic species of Neisseria, Actinomyces, Streptococcus, Candida can also often be found there. Um, if we look in between the teeth, there are actually anaerobic spaces, which are commonly inhabited by species of Fusobacterium and Prevotella. And if we move back into the oral and nasal pharynx, uh, we'll find a lot of the species we find in the mouth. So, for example, in addition to the Prevotella and the, and the Streptococcus that we, quite, that we find there in Fusobacterium, you may also find a species called Peripheromonas. Now, again, as long as they persist there, most of these are perfectly healthy and normal to have there. However, it is possible for them to be pushed in other places in response to, for example, a viral infection where they can then cause problems like sinus infections or ear infections. If we look in the respiratory tract, the normal microbiota present there aren't actually typically living in there. In fact, in your lower respiratory tract, there isn't supposed to be any sort of microbiota whatsoever, i.e. inside of your lungs or down in the bronchioles. Now, what we do see in the respiratory tract is something called the mucociliary, escal mucociliary escalator. So as you inhale things, viruses, bacteria, what can happen is they get trapped in those cilia that, that, line, that line the trachea, and they can actually begin to bring those, those cilia will actually bring those microbes up. They carry them upwards, and they actually dump them into your stomach where the acidic pH kills most of them. And this helps to protect your lungs. One of the reasons why smoking is so bad is it can actually paralyze these cilia in the mucociliary escalator and allow bacteria to make it deep inside of your lungs. This is one of the reasons why people who are smokers frequently have more respiratory infections than non-smokers do. Now, that being said, people that have damaged lungs, maybe they have emphysema or chronic, bron chronic bronchitis, these people with damaged lungs quite often do have a normal microbiota, and it's a mixture of both uh, uh, pathogenic and non-pathogenic bacteria, but this can also contribute to why these individuals frequently experience recurring, recurring respiratory infections. Now, as I said, most of the things that make it all the way up the, the mucociliary escalator are going to get dumped in the stomach. The stomach is an incredibly hostile environment with a pH of less than 4, so anything that survives there has to be able to survive in that acidic pH. There aren't many species that actually do, and those that do don't typically live in the main portion of the stomach, but rather live inside the mucus where the pH is a little bit closer to 6 or 7. One that we do frequently see living there is Heliobacter pylori. Now again, Heliobacter pylori is typically fine as long as it's kept in check by the acidic pH of your stomach. However, if that pH is changed, for example, frequent overuse of antacids can alter the pH of the stomach and allow 
allow Heliobacter pylori to overgrow, and Heliobacter, Heliobacter pylori can actually cause an opportunistic infection, which actually causes peptic ulcers. So as we move past the stomach, we enter into the duodenum and then eventually the jejunum. These are still loaded with acid from the stomach and they're also loaded with bile and most species can't survive there. Enterococcus, lactobacillus, and some carinibacterium are just about the only normal microbiota we typically find there. But as we progress lower into the intestine, we're going to find a home for many species of enterobacteriaceae. These are things like Escherichia coli and proteus species that are commonly part of our normal microbiome. We talked about those a good deal when we looked at uh, bacterial species uh, from potential bacterial pathogens. But the enterobacteriaceae, things like Bacteroides, are another common example of members of this particular group that actually are essential for helping us digest our food and protecting our body from invasion. One of the things we know about these enterobacteriaceae and Bacteroides and other species like this is they can actually help to train our immune system. You actually have little patches of immune cells throughout your intestine called Peyer's patches. And the presence of these bacteria in the intestine help to influence what types of cytokines that your, that your body's producing in order to influence immune action, as well as sort of help to teach your body to survey levels of of microbial growth to keep that microbiome in check. One of the big things we're seeing recently is a movement, uh, the probiotic movement, which is to use foods like yogurt uh, or kombucha or to simply take probiotics. These are typically ingested and what they help to do is help to replenish your GI tract microbiome. This is very good um, because it, as we've talked about before, species like Bacteroides are responsible for somewhere between 15 and 20% of the nutrition you actually gain from your food. So maintaining a healthy microbiome in your gut is very important. Now your genital urinary tract also has its own microbiome. It's typically in the distal portions of it, so it's the portions of your body that are the most exterior of it. We'll find species like Enterobacteriaceae, so Enterococcus, for example, might be found there. Lactobacillus is commonly found there. Uh, we might also find Canada, so that, that fungal yeast is often present there. Uh, and, and while it is minor, it is restricted to mainly the exterior portions of the genital urinary tract. Um, if these things start to ascend, that is go into the urethra, up into the kidneys, and so on and so forth, they can actually cause problems in the form of urinary tract infections. So today we learned about the normal microbiome. We talked about its importance and how essential it is for your survival. In fact, many researchers are now thinking of your normal microbiome as an essential part of your body, maybe even thinking of it as a virtual organ. Realize that there are three times as many cells as part of your normal microbiome than your own body cells within your own body. Also think about it this way, they exist in defined areas. They're actually inherited through vertical transmission, just like any of your own organs. They're essential for survival. Without your microbiome, you wouldn't be able to survive and disruption of your normal microbiome, as well as any other organ can have potential consequences and negative side effects on your body. Your neural microbiome is essential for your survival and maintaining it is important for you to be able to maintain a healthy immune system, as well as gaining the proper nutrition from your diet. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot today and I look forward to talking to you really soon. Bye.